power outage in state history, affecting 800,000 customers in more than 30 counties. Be the first to know breaking updates and alerts delivered straight to your phone. Download the ABC 10 News app now. All right, so thank you for joining our breaking news coverage. I'm Kirsten Holmes. And I'm Kirsten Brittany. Holmes. I couldn't say my name. No, it's been a very busy day. You've yeah. been working since four this morning. I'm Brittany Begley. All right, so we have two big stories to talk about. The PG&E shutoffs happening in just a few hours. And it is a really somber day, especially for the El Dorado County Sheriff's Department. Yeah, we first told you this this morning at six o'clock when one of their own was shot and killed yeah. while responding to an active shooter situation this morning. So this has happened in El Dorado County. This is in Somerset on Sand Ridge Road. You can see it's a very active scene. Yeah, the department mm -hmm. says another deputy with a different county was with Deputy Brian Ishmael on a ride along. That's when this all happened. That other deputy was treated from the, at the hospital and then released. A press conference was just held giving more information. Carlos Arada is live there right now with an update. Carlos, tell us what happened. Well, there's a press conference here at the El Dorado County Sheriff's Office just wrapped up about I'd say 10 minutes ago, a very short press conference with Sheriff John Diagostini here. Uh, he didn't have really much to say. He seemed really sad, though. He gave us just a, a sense of what exactly happened this morning, which is what you, what you told us and what we knew all morning long. He did tell us the investigation continues. Um, just a clarification, we did ask this morning about the uh, San Joaquin County deputy who was with uh, uh, Deputy uh, Ishmael earlier this morning. and. Uh, there was no clarification as to if they were um, in a uh, vehicle or in a law enforcement vehicle or a personal vehicle. That still remains under investigation. They told us they would have more information for us later today. But again, a very short five-minute press conference. He did refer to uh, Deputy Ishmael and his relationship with him. Um, here's what uh, Sheriff Diagostini had to say about him. He was personable, easy to talk to kind and always positive he never had a bad day he was a loving father and husband and he leaves behind his wife and three children and you can really sense the tone there with uh, sheriff diagostini uh, this morning uh, again five-minute press conference. We had no chance to ask any questions. Uh, they said they will continue updating us later today. Uh, we also uh, learned that two Hispanic men are now in custody in relation to this incident. One of those uh, men was taken to the hospital. He was uh, shot and is now in unknown condition. We also know that the uh, area where that shooting happened, which is about 15 miles southeast from Placerville, in a very remote area on Sand Ridge Road in Somerset, is closed. We have a crew there uh, this morning. Uh, that's just to remain uh, precautious and to keep residents in that area safe. But again, you can sense uh, how sad and how tragic this news is coming out of uh, uh, the uh, Sheriff's Department here in El Dorado County. Of course, we'll keep you updated all day long here on ABC 10 and all of our digital platforms. For now, we'll send it back over to you guys. All right. Thank you for that, Carlos. Again, a really sad day out there. Okay, so right now I'm being joined by Miss Mindy Russell with the Law Enforcement Chaplaincy right here in Sacramento, but you work with a lot of different people. Tell us, what does the department go through when something like this happens? Because we can feel the sadness here, but we're not working that beat every day. No, so all the people in the department are devastated, yeah. but they are mission-minded and they're task-oriented, and they got a job to do, and okay. they're going to do that until that job is done, and then the next thing they will do is help prepare the funeral and it will be a beautiful funeral yeah. and all the departments and all over the country people will attend and we will grieve together like we always do well like we always do this happens all too often let me ask you another question since we're seeing so much of this in the news there's a lot of people that want to show support how can the average person show support for law enforcement i think this is a great training time for us in our community to understand these men and women that go in harm's way every day to keep us safe that this is the time we can really roar our support so action items go and uh, put a blue light in your in your uh, night um, 
light. Mm -hmm. um, tell your kids at school to write notes. The, sh the officers really appreciate that. Yeah. Wave to them when they drive by. Walk up to them and say thank you for what you do. It matters. It yeah. really matters to these officers right now that they hear and see the support of the community. Yeah, we were listening to the press conference a little minute ago. I saw you tuning in too to hear that he leaves behind a wife and, and three kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that family is hurting. How can we support that family? We don't know them and we don't want to intrude. This is their time of right. grief, but how can we support that family right now? So that department will absolutely surround them and protect them and help them start processing, mm -hmm. but we can reach out to the department and the department will then get the information to them. Yeah. They're pretty much in shock right now. All right. Thank you so much for joining us and coming on and hanging out for us this morning. I'm sorry we had to meet under these circumstances, yes. but I appreciate your contribution to the show. All right, mm -hmm. Brittany, condolences are pouring in on Facebook. What are people saying? It's true. People from all across the country are weighing in. So here's what they're saying on Facebook. So Sierra is saying, this is heartbreaking. Brian was a regular customer at the bagel shop. He said she was kind, he was generous, and he would bring his fellow officers, his family, his wife and three children. And you could tell just by looking at him how much he adored his family. Sandra was actually his school bus driver for years. And she says this is heartbreaking. He was such a kind, good boy. Uh, Jennifer also weighed in. She said, you know what? I met him last year. She had a problem at the Carmen Park Dog Park. He came right over there and helped. He was very generous. Thousands of people are saying the same thing. So it really does set up the tone for what kind of officer, deputy he was. You can always join in the conversation on our ABC 10 Facebook page as well. And of course, for more information, make sure to download our app, our ABC 10 app. We are working round the clock to make sure you have coverage on this and everything else we're watching today. Okay, so you know we got to talk about our other big story of the day. We want to help you get ready for PG&E's power shutoffs. They're starting in just a few hours. Sierra Foothills will be the first county to be shut off. You got to know that. Yeah, I got the alert for our ABC 10 app. So the last time it left millions of people in yeah. dark, of course, I was one of them. And a little bit later, I'm going to share some tips that are going to save you a little stress and frustration. We also want to know with this round of shutoffs, will it be smaller than two weeks ago? Yes, but still, it's one of the biggest PNGE shutoff ever. And if your house is affected, I know a lot of people are frustrated. It's definitely mm -hmm. frustrating and understandably so. Now, we want you to look at this 17 counties will be affected in the Sierra Foothills, North Bay, small parts of San Mateo and Kern counties. About 179 customers will have their power shut off. That's about 450,000 people. Remember, PG&E does these shutoffs as a precaution against wildfires. They don't want their electrical equipment sparking a wildfire. And the company CEO is reminding everyone that this is all about safety. Understand the hardship created by these shutoffs and there are safety risks on both sides. But again, we've seen the impact of wildfires both over the years and recently in Southern California. And we're determined not to let that happen. Okay, so pg &E says that they will let you know by phone calls, emails, and text messages if they will cut your power to your home. And if you want more information about the shutoffs, you can text the word power to the phone number. I'm gonna say it twice. It's 916-321-3310. 916-321-3310, excuse me. And we will text you back all the information you need to know, but I know our weather team staffed around yeah. the clock to bring us updates because yeah. everybody wants to know yeah. about wind and fire. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the biggest concern, of course, is going to be the winds for the next 24 hours. Of course, we have dry humidity out there, the fuel, and the grass, the vegetation, all of that's very dry, burning quickly, if anything does spark there. So let's talk all about it. Right now, temperatures at 73 degrees. It's going to get warmer throughout the day. Warm temperatures, that's not very good for firefighters and when you could potentially try to battle some blazes. Also dry weather and humidity, that's not good for that either. Winds are already at 10 miles per hour. It's about 1140 in the morning. We're going to continue to see some warm winds uh, picking up into the afternoon, evening hours. Humidity is at 39% already. We do expect humidity to be down into the teens by today into tomorrow. So that dryness out there is not going to be helpful when it comes to any
anything that could spark a fire. All right, we're going to look at these temperatures rising even to the upper 80s by the afternoon into the evening hours. We're talking right around 4 p.m. We could hit about 88 degrees. Clear skies and sunshine, but take a look also at some of these winds here. 15, 17 mile per hour winds. This is a long, this is our duration winds. We're talking anything that hits about three plus hours. So we're right around that 15 mile per hour range into the afternoon, evening hours, but this doesn't even include gusts. Gusts could start to reach anywhere from 25 to even 50 miles per hour as we get into the foothills. Now for the valley areas, we're talking closer to about 25, 35 mile per hour wind gusts into the valley. All right, talking about this red flag warning in effect until 4 p.m. Thursday. So really in a 12 hour period from the evening hours, we're talking around 5 uh, p.m. into about 5 a.m. We'll see some of the stronger gusts really ramping up. The major portion of the event with the strong winds is going to end right around 8, at least the major portion of it. But it isn't going to be until noon that we start to see things really start calming down. Gusts 35 to 55 miles per hour. We're talking about Foothill Sierra into areas North Bay into Mount Diablo region where we tend to see some of the stronger winds. Now high temperatures are going to be in the mid to even upper 80s out there, but I want to show you this map. It's going to be a little hard to read. I know it just looks like squiggly lines at this point, but I'm going to point out to you some of the wind gusts because we are looking at them picking up early in the morning as we start approaching lunchtime. So 35 mile per hour gusts already. Uh, I already saw a 40 up here, so we're already seeing at 48 mile per hour gusts. Uh, near Butte, um, Butte County areas near Lake Oroville. So yeah, these winds are already starting up and these are the gusts that are picking up already. So moving to the afternoon and evening, we do expect it to really start intensifying. All right, let's take a look at this because this is going to really tell you and show you how it's all playing out in the next 24 hours. So we're starting here into the evening hours when everything starts to really ramp up. And this is when you're heading home from work or taking the kids out from practice. You're looking at Auburn. I know this seems deceiving here. Six mile per hour winds. They're talking about areas just down here where you start to hit some of that blue and green. We're talking about some areas in that pink and orange shade here. Take a look at our legend, 40 mile per hour winds up to even 50 mile per hour winds for areas heading into the foothills. So let me just let you know, your area, your neighborhood, you may not be feeling strong winds and you're saying, why the shutoffs? The winds aren't ramping up in my neighborhood. Well, we're talking transmission lines because a lot of these transmission lines, they are in the foothills. That is where we're seeing the big gusts, where we're looking at that pink, that orange shade, and that's where we start to see and tend to see those fires sparking. You're also looking at it, of course, toward the Bay Area as well. We're going to just focus in here for our area as we start to see this. Moving into Wednesday, 9 p.m., look at that purple shade. That is 50-plus mile-per-hour gusts as we move through tonight, and that's going to continue overnight. It doesn't start calming down until we start getting into the early morning hours, and even at 5.30 a.m., this is still ripping out there. We're looking at very strong winds right around lunchtime Thursday. That's finally where we start to see the blue and yellow green shades here. Things start to calm down just a bit. We're talking some of these winds right around 15 miles per hour into the foothills and for areas around the coastal ranges, North Bay, Santa Rosa areas, things are starting to calm down. As we move into the Friday afternoon area, we'll start to see things really start to calm down. But we are going to start talking also about a high pressure system that's going to move in on Sunday that could also create an elevated risk out there for more fire threats. Brittany. 1144. Okay, we've been asking people on Facebook, how are you preparing for the power shutoffs? That's what makes Morning Blend different. We include you and your thoughts. Now, Kaylin says what you need to do is freeze water in a double Ziploc bag. She also bought a battery phone charger and some solar lights. Now, Alexa is not playing around. She's getting gas in all her cars, as well as getting food that's easy to cook without power. And Nicole says, you know what? I am not buying any more food until this is over. And that's what Begley's bargains, why we try to save you money, because your money matters, right? And after the last shutoff, a lot of you guys were saying, my goodness, I wasted so much money on groceries. So I have a tip for you. So what you can do, you can actually do it today. It's called a one cup tip. What you're going to do is you're going to take a cup just like this, and I want you to put water in it. Go ahead and put it in your freezer. When they're both frozen, what I want you to do is put a quarter in both of them, okay? Then put them right back into your freezer, 
So what you'll do is when you come home, if it's a gushy mess like this one, if you can kind of see it, like a cup of coffee, that means your food is bad and you're going to have to throw it out. If it's still frozen and the quarters are just like a skating rink on top of your cup, then you're good to go. So that's just one tip for you. If you're coming to a jam like I did, did you know crayons will actually burn for 30 minutes? So here are some more tips for you to make sure you're prepared. Now make sure you confirm and update your contact information with PG&E. Create a safety plan for your family your children, and your pets. Have an emergency kit with food and water and make sure your phones are charged. Now, if you have a generator, this is something that we noticed two weeks ago. You have to make sure you know how to properly use it. Make sure you know how to open your garage manually and make sure to keep cash on hand and a full tank of gas. Of course, we will update you throughout the week to make sure everyone's prepared, Kirsten. Yeah. A lot going on. It is a lot going on. 1146 right now, a lot of people talking about exactly that, the potential PG&E shutoffs that are going to happen in a few hours. There were a lot of unanswered questions about the last shutoff that we had. Remember those two weeks ago? Can't forget them, right? Right now, Governor Newsom is asking PG&E to address those concerns. And he's demanding that the company be more upfront with everyone, have a more reliable website, and provide more timely updates on when power will be shut off and when it will be turned back on. Decades they have neglected investing in undergrounding and hardening their infrastructure. Uh, we're here because of their greed. We're here because of their mismanagement going back decades. Okay, so the governor also sent this letter to PG&E. It demands that the company compensate customers and businesses for losses and hardship during the shutoff. Now, at first, PG&E appeared to reject his request, but now they're singing a pretty different tune. Bill Johnson had this to say last night. He represents PG&E. Um, haven't had a lot of time to think about this. I'm thinking about it. I'm considering his request. I do think it would be inconsistent with the history here, with the policy and with the tariffs. Okay, so Johnson went on to say that he'd like to get through this fire season first and then revisit the compensation conversation when state lawmakers go back to the Capitol. But it sounds like what he's saying is don't expect any compensation anytime soon, if at all. And in Napa and Sonoma County, generators are going fast and businesses are doing everything they can to close. The Sonoma Chamber of Commerce says businesses lost millions of dollars in the last power shutoff. One burger shop that lost a lot of food last time is getting ready for the same thing to happen to them again. Last time I threw out all three of these fridges, all of them. And people, it's funny because they're like, oh, insurance takes care of it. Insurance doesn't take care of any of that. You know, I mean, like, we, we're, we're not gonna put in a claim for it. Our insurance will go up. We'll, you know, we'll have to pay, pay a huge deductible on it. It's just a loss, like straight across the board we lost. That is some real perspective. Meanwhile, as these shutoffs continue, more and more locations are saying enough is enough. San Francisco, San Jose, and Manteca are now looking into their own power companies. And now you can add Rockland to the list. ABC 10's Kevin John spoke with the mayor about it. Take a look. So is it time to ditch PG&E? Well, apparently several cities in Northern California believe that could be the case. After the power shutoffs that happened two weeks ago and with more planned for this week, some cities are beginning to get fed up with PG&E. Rockland is one of those cities considering the move from PG&E, but believe it or not, this idea came long before the shutoffs came into play. This has been a big trend that you've seen statewide, I think as a result of the power shutoffs. Rockland was sort of on the forefront of that because we actually had a proposal to um, consider alternatives before the shutoffs. And the impetus of that was the high electricity rates of PG&E when compared to our neighbors. And of course, with higher electricity rates, that can affect where businesses decide to go. When a business is looking to relocate or where they're going to do, where residents are going to live, you know, electric rates, especially for big businesses, come into account there. The mayor proposed the idea of looking into other alternatives from PG&E. However, he didn't receive enough support from the majority of city council at the time. Now, with the power shutoffs happening, he feels that will be enough to get the city council to support his proposal. But with the shutoffs, more residents and businesses are becoming concerned about um, you know, the reliability of power. So here in Rockland, for me personally, it's elevated the discussion to say, hey, look, 
we need to look at this and see if we can, if there are alternatives out there to provide more reliable power. So even if it is passed by city council, don't expect Rockland to be moving on from PG&E anytime soon. This is a very long process. And as you've seen with other cities, including here in the Sacramento region, um, like in Yolo County, I mean, that was a multi-year process. We would only want to do something like that here in Rockland if it makes sense for our residents and businesses um, to even consider it. If it doesn't make sense, we wouldn't move forward. Yeah, mm. that really paints the perspective. Hearing from that guy, hearing from that business that had yeah. to throw out refrigerators full of meat, that, that is frustrating. My power is not going to be shut off, but I am you upset for everyone for sure. who has to go through this. We deserve better. Okay, Brittany, your uh -huh. power was shut off. I saw you be frustrated. I saw Brittany bring mm -hmm. her child into work because the school was out too. Yes, what all his parents had to think about, right? What do we do with our kids if they're not in school? I got literally the last case of water from the Target in my wow. neighborhood, the last two battery chargers, and I got the last flashlight, which I paid $34 for. So I was frustrated, but I'll tell you this. Uh -huh. Yesterday I was at the post office, right? And I talked to somebody. He didn't know what I did for a living. We were just chatting and he said, you know what, my brother, he works for PG&E. Let me tell you what he's doing right now. He's going to people's houses that have oxygen oxygen tanks, making okay. sure that they have generators. Okay. He also said, you know, people are frustrated with the workers and, you know, yelling and screaming at them. Yeah. And I thought, you know what, I need to take a step back because yes, I am frustrated, but there is another side to the story. Yeah. yeah. So it's always great to have that conversation. That's good. Um, yeah, workers for PG&E, we know it's not y'all. Yeah. But please pass along our frustrations to your boss because we deserve better. All right, so we have a Facebook Live going on right now. Thank mm -hmm. you for everyone who is watching. I want to say hi to Charlotte. I want to say hi to Justine, Annette, Jeffrey. Jeffrey says, wow. Jeffrey is What's really upset. He said something to expect anything less from PG&E would be kind of delusional. Jeffrey, I, I feel your frustration. Amy says, my heart and prayers go out to this family. Rest in peace to that officer. Yeah. We have two really big stories that we're covering. The mm. deputy that was shot and killed in El Dorado County yeah. and the PG&E shutoffs. Speaking of, it's all weather related. So, you know, we got to go to Carly and get an update on all this wind that we're about to have. Right, Carly? Absolutely. We are looking at the winds as the biggest factor when it comes to the PG&E shutoffs because, of course, all those winds could cause tree debris, anything to really hit power lines and cause a spark, which, of course, could lead to a fire. So, let's talk about this 24-hour period of fire weather, low humidity, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. That means anything that sparks could start to spread rapidly because it is so dry out there. We have barely any moisture in the air. Wind gusts 35 to about 55 miles per hour. So red flag warning in place for Northern California. We're also talking Southern California. Don't forget our friends down there too. And now this added area leading all the way to Vegas. And guess why? Because we have a lot of people that take certain roadways that head to Vegas that have a lot of grassy areas. So it's also people and power lines that could cause these sparks. So not just a uh, just, uh, you know, transmission lines, PG&E. It's also people too. So we have uh, an added area here heading toward Vegas that also sees a red flag warning. So let's talk about our area and what we're going to see and how we're going to be impacted. This fire weather warning in effect until 4 p.m. Thursday for much of Northern California. It is already starting up here for us as of early this morning around 8 a.m. And here is why we have ISO bars that are very close together. We're talking about pressure gradients. I know that's what is that, right? We have a low pressure system. We have a high pressure system. What does that mean? They're pushing against each other. They're opposites. We have strong winds flowing through here along a jet stream that's now shifting further north. This is causing a lot of chaos in the atmosphere. And when that happens, we start to see the rotation of this high pressure system leading to strong winds in the valley, in the foothills, in areas of the Sierra, and also for the coastal ranges, our friends in the North Bay. So these northerly winds are going to intensify today as temperatures also start to heat up. So it all plays a part. Temperatures, dry air, that humidity out there, the strong winds, all three coupled together as a power couple, right, to really start to bring in a lot of these strong winds and fire weather. All right, the gust 35 to about 55 miles per hour, at least through Thursday morning. That's going to be really the peak of it all. So we're talking these winds. When are we going to expect them to really start up? Well, we're talking about later this evening as you're heading home from work or school and taking the kids out from practice. The foothills start to see these pink colors here. I know it says six, but we're not talking six. We're talking, look at the legend there, 40 to 50 mile per hour winds, especially right around 930 p.m. We can see them really picking up 55 plus miles per hour winds there through the Sierra. These are areas where transmission lines are. These are where we could see sparks. So it may not be in your neighborhood and you're saying it's not that windy. Hey, it's windy somewhere else. And of course, that's also the concern with PG&E and the power lines. 
All right, moving into 8 a.m., we're still seeing a lot of these areas very windy, and you can see that for your commute in the morning. And then finally, right around lunchtime, we start to see things calming down before uh, things really start to take a break as we move toward the weekend. But Sunday, just be ready. We could see another event of high pressure moving in that'll start ramping up a potential risk, an elevated risk for potential fire dangers Sunday. All right, let's look at these humidities here. 35% Sacramento right now, 23 in Fairfield. We're starting to see these numbers dropping. Once we start to see anywhere from 10 to 20%, that's where it starts getting getting even more dangerous, especially with the winds picking up. Get ready for the fires. Have an evacuation plan. Sign up for the wireless emergency alerts. Keep your phone handy and charged. Keep TV or radio on for, of course, any alerts. If you don't obviously have power, you're going to head to the radio or even your phones. And then also the NOAA radio could be a good thing for you if you consider that for the future. Kirsten. Yeah, 1156. I know. You know, as we talk about power lines and fires, I want to add some context and perspective because it sure feels like in California that this is a PG&E thing or a Southern California Edison thing or the management of power uh, throughout the state. And it just seems like we're all alone on this. And I just want to let you know, as frustrating as it is going through it in California, this is happening all over the world. Let me give you an example behind me. This is Australia. Uh, in that part of the world, they call wildfires bushfires. Uh, they have a very long dry period, just like we do in California. So there's some similarities, uh, but the trees are different. These are gum trees. In California, we call these eucalyptus trees. But the reality is the same, is that they've discovered over the years that a large number of their big famous fires were caused by power line failures. So let me just read through this, and then I want to show you the date, because that's important. They say that this is an article from 2013. This is six years ago. Bushfire risks, so wildfire risks posed by power line failures are in the spotlight following last week's crisis in New South Wales with officials at odds over whether electricity should be cut in extreme weather conditions. Here's some context. One rural power company, South Australia, would cut power ahead of big wildfire and uh, big uh, uh, fire weather events. Uh, New South Wales, which is a much more urbanized area, that's where Sydney is, famous Sydney, they were skeptical of doing this because they thought of all the downsides uh, that lay ahead of them. Well, what's happened is over the years, they've decided that yes, they're gonna cut the power. And in fact, I wanna show you a video here. This is in Western Australia, same kind of situation. It's kind of rural, kind of urban at the same time, but they have these very slick public relation videos warning people about the risks of fire and power lines and the fact that they will cut power ahead of time to prevent fires. So they are dealing with the same situation from years ago, an ongoing, very controversial topic in big weather events with fire weather, do you cut the power or not? Many power companies around the world are deciding to err on the side of caution uh, because they know what may happen next. It's an international issue that everybody's trying to solve and we hope it gets solved soon. That is good perspective. Yeah. I really want to say thank you so much for watching us and trusting us with your news and weather. Thank you, Jonathan, Sandra, Terry, and also Justine and hey, Jeffrey all. for commenting on our Facebook page. We'll answer your questions when we get off TV. Yeah. All right, let's talk winds because that's yeah, the big event yeah. with the red flag. Warning, winds picking up tonight, everyone. We're talking into the evening hours and for the next 12 mm. hours after that, that's when we can see the strongest wind gusts. Take a look at our 10-day mid-80s for really the next four days or so before we really drop temperature Sunday. 77 degrees, but that drop-off doesn't mean, hey, it's cool and we're calming down. That actually might be mm. a bad sign for us because wow. another high pressure system may be moving in, really which can. is similar to this one. When we're talking pressure gradients, you have a low, you have a high next to each other. They rub each other the that wrong way. That makes wind. That can yeah. make wind. Yeah. You know? I learned that from Rob and whether you know. <laughs> All right. So this is the end our coverage for now. Again, we had two really big news stories mm -hmm. of the day. The El Dorado County deputy killed in the line of duty and the PG&E yeah. power shutoffs that they just confirmed that will happen those are coming your way, folks. And don't forget to go to our website, abc10.com, on Facebook. We're going to be checking it around the clock. We'll explain this cup experiment as well so that you can save money when it comes to your groceries, Kirsten and Carly. Right. I was looking at this, mm -hmm. like. All right. All right. We'll Thanks. see you guys later.